Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. My name is Oliver Munya and I'm part of the Global Forest Coalition's climate campaign and communications teams. I'll be facilitating this webinar and my colleague Karina um, is taking care of the technical side of things. If you have any problems hearing what um, is being said or seeing shared screens or videos, please just write a message in the chat box to let us know and we'll sort it out as soon as we can. I'd also like to ask our panelists to speak as slowly and clearly as possible and to let you all know that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube uh, account uh, after the event. Uh, the webinar will last for two hours. We've got four speakers lined up for you. They'll each present for 10 to 15 minutes and then after each presentation, we'll take two questions from the audience and then whatever time we have left at the end will also be for Q&A. Uh, so if you've got a question for one of the panelists, please type it into the question and answer box that you should see at the bottom of your screen. And then I'll read them out in the order that they're received. And if your question's for a specific panelist, please indicate which one. So our speakers will introduce themselves properly when they speak, but I'll also just briefly introduce them now. So first of all, Federica Gionta from Fazer Espírito Santo in Brazil will describe a case study that we published yesterday on the social and environmental impacts of a global environment facility project in the producing sustainable charcoal for the iron and steel industry in the Brazilian state of Minas Gerais. And she'll talk about her three week fact finding visit to the area. Next, David Kariba from NAEP in Uganda will talk about a case study we published last year on another global environment facility project and his visit to communities living near eucalyptus plantations that were established to produce charcoal for the domestic market in Uganda. Almuth Ernsting from Bathy Watch Scotland will then present an investigation into climate finance for clean cookstove projects in the global south uh, that's found no clear evidence that they're improving women's health or reducing wood use despite cookstoves being a favourite for climate and development finance. And finally, Leanne Shalatek from from the Heinrich Bell Foundation USA will discuss civil society efforts to prevent the Green Climate Fund from financing projects that involve monoculture tree plantations and biomass electricity. So before I hand over to our speakers, I'd like to give you just a little bit of background on this work that we've been doing on climate finance. So over the past couple of years, we've been working with the Heinrich Bell Foundation and other organizations involved in the German Climate Finance website to assess the impacts that Germany's contribution to climate finance that's directed towards tree plantation and bioenergy is having. Initially, we looked at bilateral climate finance, so between Germany and a number of different receiving countries, and we published a number of case studies, including on projects in India, Paraguay, and Serbia. More recently, our focus has been on multilateral mechanisms that Germany is a major contributor to, such as the Global Environment Facility, which is shortened to GEF, by the way. If you hear someone say GEF, it's Global Environment Facility. Um, and Federica, David, and Almuth will tell you all, more about this uh, in more detail. So we're hoping that these case studies on GEF finance that evaluate projects that have either just ended or are in their final stages can contribute to advocacy work aimed at future finance for tree plantations and bioenergy, such as is increasingly popular in the Green Climate Fund, uh, which Leanne will describe, uh, and other more recent international mechanisms such as the Bond Challenge and the African Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative. Uh, so for now, I'll hand over to our speakers. Um, and first of all, I'd like to introduce Federica. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, bom dia a uh, também as companheiras do Brasil. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, here I'm to show the investigation I have done on December 2019 that was commissioned by Global Forest Coalition to document the impact of charcoal production uh, for the iron steel uh, sector and produced by eucalyptus plantation. Uh, the, the impacts on the environment and community of uh, Mira, Minas Gerais were um, were seen in the context of the were analyzed in the context of the project production of sustainable renewable biomass based charcoal for the iron and steel um, industry in Brazil. This uh, project project, uh, as Oliver said before, uh, was founded by the Global Environmental Facility Fund, 
the GEF and was implemented locally, uh, like interfaces with um, uh, co uh, Brazilian company, local uh, NGO, banks, uh, uh, by the United Nations Development Program and by the government of Brazil itself. So I'm going to show you um, a small uh, map so you can uh, uh, recognize the, the area. This. So um, the first week uh, of the investigation was spent in the north part of um, uh, Minas Gerais that we have to remember that is big uh, uh, like uh, French, so it's really big and um, is, is the part that has the highest concentration of eucalyptus plantation in the state. And um, I, I start from the second annual meeting of traditional Veredeiras community that was a festival that brought together 2,250 um, representatives of the diverse traditional communities, indigenous people, people and quilombolas of the area. And from there, I, that was in San Joaquim, I was visiting Bonito das Minas, Rio Acho dos Machado, and Rio Pardo das Minas. Uh, three places that, that have been impacted over the last 40 years by eucalyptus plantation. Um, when we talk about uh, uh, impacted by eucalyptus plantation, we don't just talk about uh, the plantation, like uh, uh, three, the presence of this like huge um, giant uh, tree. Um, but we are talking about uh, all these dynamics that the company start uh, in a territory, like uh, um, taking lands, like blackmail leaders, like dispossessed um, a community. So it's not just the presence of the tree, but is the, the real problem, the, pre the, the previous problem is the presence of the company in the community. So after this uh, first week uh, in the in the um, community of the north of, of Minas Gerais, uh, the second week was focused on the state capital of Minas Gerais, Belo Horizonte, where representative of the institution that um, are involved in the in this project, in, in the Jeff project, were interviewed. Um, and uh, I included here a visit uh, in the Sech Lagoas, that is a uh, area with the highest concentration of steel and iron companies. Um, and, uh, and I participate to a public hearing on resumption of the rural land relocalization in Nina Gerais. Uh, to better understand the delicate relationship between uh, land ownership, uh, companies, and traditional communities. The third week, uh, I visited the first uh, sustainable charcoal production, first of two present, um, that was built in the south part of Minas Gerais, in La Mim. And as well, I visit two university, Vissosa University and uh, São João do Rei, uh, because the university are part of whom uh, is founding the, the project. Uh, if we talk about the budget, of course, the project is around 44 million dollars, of which 7 million is provided as a grant by the GEF, and the other 36 million is provided as co financing uh, uh, by the national government, by the DSS, that is the local um, uh, development bank, uh, private sector, and the university too. Um, the first uh, doubt that I have is that um, on the Jeff uh, like site web website 
you can find the project called named like production of sustainable renewable uh, biomass based charcoal for the iron and steel industry in brazil where the charcoal have a central uh, presence uh, in, when I was uh, in the area, so locally, um, the, um, the project is known um, commonly as uh, uh, Siderurgia Sustentable, uh, so iron and steel uh, sustainable sector. So all the focus was not on the part of charcoal, but was on the part of the iron and steel sector. So there was a, uh, a clear uh, cle cleavage between uh, global and local. Um, if we talk about the project, this aims to reduce the greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions from the iron and steel sector in Minas Gerais by developing uh, um, um, a, a conversion technology for sustainable charcoal production. But what does it mean, like uh, in, in Brazil, um, sustainable charcoal? Like, uh, which are the par parameters that, that define a charcoal sustainable? Um, in Brazil, the, the legislation said the charcoal is considered uh, sustainable if produced in a modern furnace and if the wood is sourced by tree plantation, as opposed so to no renewable if wood is sourced by from native forests. Uh, therefore. Uh, in yours, uh, um, any carbon dioxide emission wet, uh, when uh, it is turned into charcoal and burp, for example. Um, but as we know, there are more and more scientific uh, I, um, evidence refuse this approach, including a recent study that showing uh, that uh, even burning plantation increase carbon pollution in the atmosphere for more than four decades. So we are not surprised, for example, that uh, deforestation alert area in uh, 2019 increased by almost 50% in the Amazon and 25% in the Serrata. But that didn't stop uh, uh, the current president of cutting fire prevention budget. So here we have uh, not just an ethical etymologic uh, problem, but a really like deep problem. No, what are we name? What are we calling uh, sustainable? For who this is sustainable? No, so. If now we focus uh, on the iron and steel sector, that is the that in Brazil is the world's larger producer of charcoal, the 90% of the production is used uh, by the iron and steel industry that remains the larger industrial emitter uh, of greenhouse gases in Brazil. So this sector now also focus on developing eucalyptus plantation for charcoal production as a carbon sink. So the carbon trade market, uh, the international carbon trade market, create this kind of dynamics too. That this iron steel sector, the most polluted in Brazil, is like use the plantation to create a carbon sink. In uh, 2018, Brazil had uh, uh, five, uh, uh, around six million hectares of uh, eucalyptus uh, plantation, and Minas Gerais continues to have the largest area of plantation of the country. Um, so this led to a progressive, I want to show another photo. So this uh, um, led to a progressive destruction of the forests 
and pasture of the predominant cerrado biome, as reported, for example, in the publication of Fase Espiritu Santo and Carbon Trade Watch, Aungi as Arbores Sound Deserto. The cerrado biome is the world's world the most biodiverse savanna and is the and is the scenery that communities of the north part of um, Minas Gerais. Evo uh, transport evo Evo transpiration in the Cerrado and Amazon, we have to remember that influences rainfall all over the area. So we are talking almost on all the south part of Brazil. Uh, and um, the principal threat to, uh, to, to, to the survival of uh, the Cerrado is the uh, undiscriminated advance of agricultural frontier for the production of eucalyptus, soya, and cattle ranching, for example. Um, if, we sh if we share a um, thought of, uh, of a man that I met in Brazil of an interview, we see that uh, water um, and this plantation of eucalypto have deforested highly biodiverse forests, dried up and polluted water courses, and treated the whole northern region of the state with desertification. And the traditional people of the area have lost access to the land and uh, resources were owned and used in past uh, like in a common way commonly with rules and principles guiding their use established by traditional community in line with ecological limits but now um, the bus the the majority of the land is handed over the plantation companies in concept in a concession by state institution or fraudulently titled as private land through various land grabbing process. So um, when we talk about uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, for this company no, that uh, is managing uh, um, the plantation, for example. Uh, who we are talking about, because we can think that we are talking about a sustainable project, so maybe they are involved, uh, like uh, family-based uh, um, companies that produce uh, charcoal or the plant tree, you know, community-based uh, projects for planting uh, uh, tree, you know, that we, they can use for um, eucalyptus. But no, um, Jeff, um, the Jeff Found and the uh, United Nations Development Program uh, decide to um, uh, to finance um, for company with um, highly questionable track records uh, that have been uh, directly subsidized to produce the so-called uh, sustainable charcoal through the project. So if we see the, fin the financiation, here we have the Valorec, the Plantar, Arslotal, and Rima. And I think that most of of these, um, of them are not new to us. Uh, I, I, uh, through the interview, I understand how plantar have and the Rima have associated with the historical land, grab, land grabbing and are still sing singled out by communities for the impact that they um, that their uh, plantation are having on biodiversity and the water courses, like for example the uh, Rio, the river uh, uh, São Francisco, that is one of the biggest uh, in Brazil. 
In addition, Rima industry was recently exposed as being involved in the charcoal mafia, a case which uh, fraudulently sourced the illegal charcoal products by deforestation a significantly lower price. The Valorec uh, companies has in the past been uh, complete complicit in uh, violence gay local communities and the murder of a farmer through the action and its armed guards. The giant steel producer ArcelorMittal that we have to in Italy has also been fined numerous time for hair quality breaches and they recently had to relocate a large number of families from their home because of a dangerous tailing, tailing dam uh, at risk of collapse in one of, the, of its mines in uh, Minagerais. So, um, to conclude, uh, I, mm, I, I, mm, I can stay here like speaking about uh, the impact of this project on women, the impact of the project on water, on environment, on the life of mm, a lot of people, but uh, but at the end, what I have to say is uh, that this project is a really good example of the danger of private sector involvement in climate fin finance, where commercial interests are prioritized over impact on communities and the environment. So uh, I'm very glad that all of you gave me this space. I hope that was all clear and uh, I'm ready for uh, like as well any question. Thank you. Great, thank you very much Federica, um, that was brilliant. Um, so I've got um, a number of questions already, uh, which is brilliant. Um, I'll take the first two just now. Um, but first, I'd like to invite uh, Daisy Bishbu from um, Heinrich Böll Foundation in Brazil just to talk a bit about the work that um, they've been doing over there. So, hello everyone. I'm Daisy Bishbu, Substitute Coordinator of Social Environmental Program at the Brazilian Office of Heinrich Böll Foundation. And I am here only to present you all the Brazilian campaign for defense of Cerrado. Certainly, Frederica from Fazi will know or can contribute with her inputs about this important coalition of civil society actors. They are united to prevent one of the major Brazilian biome. But as some of the most important partners of the Brazilian Office of Bull Foundation are related to this campaign, as Fazi, Caritas, the movement of family appeasement, I would like to open a parenthesis in this seminar and present you the campaign. The campaign started in 2016 and encompassed more than 15 local, national and international organizations as well as social movements. Its actions focus on raising awareness about the impacts not only about the florestation in Cerrado Savanna for the environmental balance, but also the impact of major infrastructure projects related to mining, energy, and even eucalyptus plantation. Brazilian legislation does not guarantee total protection to the Cerrado Savanna. Only 11% of its whole area is made up for natural reserves for units conservations among which only three percent of three percent establishes total protection 50 percent of the territory of amazonia rainforest for example is under protection the Cerrado savanna occupies one quarter of brazilian territory it is located in the central area of brazil and it spreads across 11 states more than half of Cerrado's territory has already suffered the deforestation, the elimination, or even the replacement of the original vegetation makes the water springs disappear and causes the destruction of river sources. 
the pressure of the land belonging to traditional people has been growing and created an intense process of land grabbing and speculation that caused many conflicts. There is money from United States, German, Sweden, and Holland being invested in deforestation and forced evictions. It comes through pension funds, multilateral banks, and export credit agency. The feeling of native visitation, rural expansion, and the low number of protected areas makes the hub one of the main sources of greenhouse gases emission in Brazil. Seven billion tons of gases in the last 30 years. Currently, 45% of the original area is occupied by pasture and agricultural crops. Only 7.7 .7 of the territory has public areas with full protection to conserve natural habits. Ibama data in the 90 hundred fines of deforestation in region were imposed in 2018. The advancement of agribusiness in Sahab and other type of energy projects has occurred mainly in places where headwaters of of the main rivers are found with the appropriation of water for irrigation and intense deforestation. According to the Atlas of Irrigation produced by the National Water Agency based on FAO, Brazil is among the 10 countries with the largest area occupied for irrigation in the world between 2006 and 2014. There was an increase of 43% percent of the area irrigated by central pivots in the country, which means that 380,000 headquarters. So based on this process, the national campaign in defense of Cerrado changed its slogan, without Cerrado, without water, without life. And more than 50 organizations, movie, movements and entities start to fight and we can ask ourselves what the campaign have to say about the eucalypt problem. Eucalypts drying up springs, people from Cerrado denounce capital advance in this bioma, and almost five decades after the beginning of its implementation, eucalypts monoculture has more has become the main factor of the heritorialization of water resources in the same arid region of Minas Gerais. This is the words of Walter Viana, responsible for environmental inspection and superintendence of environmental and sustainable development of the north of Minas and author of this, the thesis of desertification in the region. As a measure to combat the water death is caused by this culture, environmentalists defend that the prohibition of new plantations in region while reforestation companies deny to the damage or reject proposal, remembering that the sector accounts 90% of the gross domestic products in Minas Gerais. So the campaign is fighting against these bigger infrastructure projects to protect to protect Cerrado's traditional people. And I invite you all to follow them and to know more about its, its important role in defense of Brazilian diversity. Thank you very much, Daisy. Thanks very much. Um, okay, great. So we'll just um, take the first two uh, questions for Federica and hopefully we'll be able to get back to the rest of them at the end. Uh, so the first one is from Melissa Moreno. Um, who says, can you explain a little bit more of how the carbon industry is offsetting emissions through the carbon market? And then the second one is from Zoltan Kun, who says, do you have uh, the market information about how or where the harmful products are used, or to be more concrete, what the role of the European Union market is in, uh, in this destruction in Brazil? So Federica, back to you. So, um, hola, Melissa. Um, uh, we can say that a component of the project is allowing uh, the companies. Oh, sorry. Ah, yeah. Hey, can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. Okay, sorry. Um, is allowing company the possibility of adding value to charcoal production or offsetting their home emission through generating carbon credits 
Um, Hater from burning sustainable charcoal instead of no renewable in charcoal that, as I said at the beginning, the difference is that one is produced with three plantation and the other one is produced by um, um, uh, native forest. And not just native forest, but we are talking about two um, mineral coal too. Um, or from reducing uh, um, methane emission from the charcoal production process. Um, I, I have to say that uh, um, uh, something uh, like that happened in the last five years that are the disaster of uh, Mariana and of Brumadinho have an impact on this because the uh, view, the classification of the min mineral coal was like at, at least more negative. So the state of Minas Gerais where those uh, um, uh, like huge uh, um, impact uh, happened uh, was uh, really dedicated in a campaign against uh, mineral coal and uh, switched totally the um, the I, uh, the scene uh, to just to impulse the um, ch sustainable charcoal. So we have to value in the question equ equ uh, these two. Um, carbon trading in this way uh, not only reward company uh, for high polluting and imaging activity, but allow other in industry to carry on pollute pollution um, through purchasing the credits rather than uh, uh, reducing the or emission. So I think that the relationship uh, between the oh sorry I I lost the question okay it disappeared but I think that I I was on it sorry I I just lost the question no, I um, think that this was the, the, the second question Federica yeah. Okay, so that's what the role of the European Union market is in uh, the habitat and social destruction in Brazil. Uh, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think, um, yeah. I, I, yeah, we can we can answer that maybe in the chat box to Zoltan. Yeah, um, I think so. And, it's quite uh, long and sure. the one too, uh, and complicated, but it's a good question. Zoltan, I'm going to to type the as well. Cool. Thanks. Thank you very much. That, yeah, thanks very much, Federica, for your presentation and for answering yeah. the questions. And like Thank I said, you. hopefully we can... Um, we can answer the, the other questions. Yeah, the... I was, I'm going to type it. Perfect, thank you. Um, great, so next I would like to ask David Kariba uh, to present to us, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Oli, and uh, to all the viewers, and to the person who has just presented, that he has actually done a good job. Uh, like Oli has said, my name is is David. I work with the National Association of Professional Environmentalists and uh, I worked with GFC to look at visit the communities that were near eucalyptus plantations where GEF had, produced, had established plantations for making charcoal. Uh, the main reason why we went into investigating this, we are looking at a project that was addressing the barriers, adoption of improved charcoal production technologies and sustainable land management practices through integrated approach. This was a government uh, implemented project that was supported by GEF and uh, we support from National Development Program, United Nations Development Program. And uh, it was implemented by government of Uganda and it was premised on the fact that Uganda keeps losing forests at a very alarming rate of 1.8 per year, which is equivalent to 90,000 hectares of forest loss. And uh, uh, 
80% of the population in Uganda depends on biomass. That is fuel wood, firewood, and this originates from the forest. And uh, when, you look at, when the government looked at that percentage, then it thought wise that probably by introducing plantations, then would substitute further encroachment on the uh, forests for uh, producing biomass for communities to cook. So the project was approved in 2013, and it had to uh, spend four years of had four years of implementation. So from 2013 by 2019, it was ending. And this project was implemented by Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development in collaboration with the Ministry of Water and Environment, National Forest Authority, Nyabia Forest College, and the four districts in Uganda. Uganda has 135, but the four districts were identified because they are highly into charcoal making and using the, the rudimental methods. So the government thought that it would be wise for these communities that were high in terms of charcoal producing rudimentary, that it would introduce uh, this kind of uh, charcoal production in a sustainable manner, where a little uh, wood, food lots would be used to, pro, pro, uh, to, to produce a lot of charcoal, and, and that would save forests. And it would, in, in turn, also work on reducing deforestation uh, due to large uh, traditional approaches to charcoal making. And uh, of course, with communities, in, some com in these four districts, communities also derive their livelihoods, their income from uh, the selling of charcoal. So that largely, look, they looked at how they could make these communities probably use the Kasemene approaches of making charcoal so that now a lot of you know, wood is not lost in the process of producing charcoal. And therefore that would, in, the, in one way or the other, stop communities from encroaching the forest. So uh, uh, the main people that were heading the implementation, they, they were the district environment and natural resources officers in those districts that I mentioned above. And the project uh, attracted a funding of 3.4, uh, 3.48 million US dollars. Like I said, uh, from uh, uh, GF and 14.6. Uh, 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 just a moment. The project was co-financed by FAO and UN Capital Development Fund, GIZ, and Belgian Technical Corporation and Government of Uganda. The total of 3.8, 14.6 million US dollars. Uh, the project was, like I mentioned earlier, was funded on the premise that it would produce uh, hundreds of kasemene and retort kilns to communities which would now be introduced and replaced, replaced charcoal making uh, strategies in, in, in the local communities. And that would mean it would reduce on the wood that would be used. And of course, the traditional method is given that they use a lot of energy in the process of burning. It would produce wood charcoal, but also uh, it would produce wood charcoal, but also not using the indigenous species. And but in the process of planting the uh, uh, eucalyptus species, eventually uh, the communities ended up also destroying the original species that were already in the landscape. And to us and to communities, and when we were doing this study, uh, we saw that really, if for example, one is going to introduce a monoculture and the indigenous species are destroyed, cut down, is that emission reduction? or increasing emissions. So to us, when we saw the kind of communities, I can, I can even, I, I can uh, uh, share my screen and uh, you look at, uh, you can look at, uh, you can share the screen, you look at the communities. Uh, I don't know, let's see, let me see. Let me see. 
I don't know, are you able to see the photograph where uh, the communities are using the kiln in the field, Kathmandu kiln? Um, at the, Karib, yeah. at the moment we can just see the, the Zoom um, screen of your web browser ah. and not the photos. I know the, the photos are not seen, but I've, I've now projected it. It is not seen or? Uh, no. Um, I don't know if maybe you need to select a different um, screen share option. Ah, there you go. It came very briefly and then disappeared again. Oh, how are they? Why did they drop it? Anyhow, if it has uh, really not come, I think, because um, I shared and uh, it is not coming. If it is not coming, I can, I can stop and continue. Uh, like I said, I wanted to show you the communities, the photograph in the communities, and I wanted to show you the the, uh, the plantation that was that were being established. I don't know why they are not being uh, they are not sharing. I don't know. I don't know if it's an internet challenge or something, but uh, anyhow, I can. I, I think I can share. Uh, these photographs later. Oh, that's worked. We can see the uh, photographs now. You can see the what? We can see your presentation now, yeah. So can you see the, the, the eucalyptus plantation that was established in very dry area where communities used to grow food and now there was establishment of eucalyptus. Can you see the eucalyptus species now? Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Uh -huh. And the, the communities with the kiln in the community, can you, can, you, can you also see it? Yeah, yeah, we can see that too. Okay. Uh, those are some of uh, the photographs I wanted to share with you. And uh, like I said, those two approaches were aimed at reducing the overuse of trees in the, in the production of charcoal. But in the process, you can imagine a lot of, for example, ficus and antaresis being displayed, like macamia, adivisia species, acacias, all those were cut. Now one imagines, if, for example, you're introducing a monoculture, eucalyptus that is allegedly saying that scientists have, have done this, there is a lot of uh, water that is consumed by some of these species, and you introduce it in an area which, are, which actually uh, receive little rainfall, and you're introducing one monoculture. What implication does it have on the community livelihood, especially when it comes to food production? And when one is tempting to say we are uh, addressing issues of, you know, reducing emissions, addressing issues of climate change, doing conservation, to us that uh, the introduction of the GF funded project really, so that it was kind of bringing in uh, an issue that was actually promoting climate change. So, what were the responses of communities when we visited them? We did not see any enough charcoal being uh, produced by communities because the kilns that were supposed to be uh, given to communities, the ones that were even given to them could not work. The species of wildlife and trees disappeared because looking at the acreage of the trees that were, were planted, most of these indigenous species that were endemic ended up disappearing. And in the process, of course, uh, the local climate got compromised because when you look at transpiration, combining it with evaporation to become evapotranspiration could not be supported by uh, eucalyptus. Eucalyptus really does not really promote that to a level of indigenous species. The medicinal herbs for communities that they used to get from some of these areas disappeared. And still, much as the project was looking at reducing uh, the encroachment on forest. Still, the remaining natural forest continued to be cut because there was no alternative. After all, the area where they used to get firewood had been cleared for eucalyptus. So that one, in a way, compromised uh, the communities and communities still continued to encroach on the forest. And when you look at the aim of the project, really, it, it did not kind of, you know, match it up. Uh, Communities also claimed their land was much more drier than how it was before. Reason that places where they used to say, which used to be waterlogged, could no longer be waterlogged. 
it, it, it they alleged the water the, the, the eucalyptus had consumed all the water and this compromised the full sovereignty of these communities and i cannot really uh, jump this during this covid when we talking to our communities and when we are at home the primary thing that we have been concentrating on has been food nobody has eaten trees nobody has eaten carbon but people have been depending on food and food that people are sovereign with food sovereignty not food for both from the supermarkets those were people who are told to keep at home it means that people had to feed on food around them so in a one or the other way we look at this project it compromises the food for sovereignty of the communities because uh, the areas that where some of them used to grow food eventually they got compromised and uh, they ended up uh, planting tree, uh, uh, eucalyptus trees some of these communities majority of them were cattle rearers and of course with cattle rearing it comes it goes with grass and water so water became scarce equally also grass disappeared somehow it compromised the ability of the communities to continue doing a cattle rearing as they approach as their preoccupation uh, communities in all those few districts uh, were implanted were encouraged to plant uh, on a large scale and of course this one like i said it compromised uh, Please. But remember, when we were conducting this uh, research, we found out that there was another project that had earlier been introduced, and that is Global Climate Change Alliance. That the Global Climate Alliance project was also looking at planting indigenous and pine and breviaria species in the same environment. So almost the whole now uh, place ended up becoming a monocultural districts became like monocultural supporting districts where uh, biodiversity was becoming was getting compromised so it was very hard for communities to differentiate between green channel uh, green charcoal project and uh, the gcca project which i earlier mentioned and uh, even though they had not been implemented concurrently still they confused them they are all planting trees alien species and they didn't see anything any kind of value added in terms of uh, food production, in terms of income, in terms of selling team, in terms of all that. So they, it, they, there wasn't much seen. Uh, like I mentioned still, uh, communities were told to plant eucalyptus and so that they could improve charcoal production. But it takes a very long time for these trees to grow. And of course, community needs and demands are always, you know, kind of uh, result, they always need, need they always need so it, it became a little bit conflicting as now growing growing trees was not making communities resilient as this compromised the food production and of course if for example a person uh, sacrifices land for uh, tree plantings it means that now it would be compromised in terms of food buying food and producing food and this one could not make communities resilient and in that way, uh, communities thought it was not wise for them to be advised to grow trees instead of first growing food crops that could generate them income and that could also, trees that could also absorb rather than trees that would eventually be harvested and eventually still carbon gets back into the environment. That would not serve any serious purpose. There was no guarantee when one looks at the objectives and what was achieved that uh, the project achieved carbon uh, emission reduction in the charcoal through the charcoal supply chain there was no guarantee whatsoever because the targets were avoiding deforestation and uh, carbon emissions from charcoal uh, supply chain and uh, from the few kilns that were sent and from the tree species that were planted. And given that communities also did not get enough, and they continued also to cut the already existing forests, then the, the project in conclusion really did not achieve its intended project, I mean, its, its intended uh, objective. Uh, there was no guarantee uh, that wood produced reduced pressure on forests because still communities 
continued to put pressure on forests. And due to poor design, uh, the, uh, the poor design led to widespread of plantations in uh, most in, 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 in large areas of the district. And this one compromised biodiversity existence as uh, because there was introduction of a mono monoculture. On the contrary, communities also reported that there was low productivity or almost no productivity because of the drier conditions that were experienced after this project was introduced. And instead of helping communities to mitigate climate change, eucalyptus uh, plantation actually undermined the ability of communities to adapt to changing climate because there is no way one plant cuts and then you say mitigating climate change. Uh, this project somehow shifted communities from conservation of native species to alien species, and which uh, I think, and from uh, the researchers, really that was not their aim, and that was not the reason why it should have been established. Because if communities are now uh, faced with species that they used not to have, and uh, the climate is changing, then that becomes a challenge. Given the above, that issues mentioned that were given by communities, I think questions should come and should be sent to GF, UND, UNDP, and GIZ, and other organizations that were involved in funding and implementing this project, whether or not, uh, the intended objective should do this, but also we should send out a clear signal to the donors to refrain from financing projects involving bioenergy and tree plantations because they impact negatively on biodiversity and local livelihoods. Such investment should be redirected towards approaches that have been proven to work and which of these include community conservation initiatives and genuinely fast sustainable renewable energy technologies. Oli, I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kariba. Um, that was great. Um, I'll just have a look at questions specifically for you. Um, okay, so the only one that I can see specifically for you is about um, whether GIZ has been informed about the impacts of this project. Um, do, do you want to answer that, David? Or, or yes. Yes, I, I think this, this was the next, next move. After getting the, the, the report, we wanted to actually share with them and have a, a time to discuss with them and really share the impacts of the findings that we have, the voices of communities with them and see if there is a way they can address this. Thanks. I, I can actually also tell you that uh, GIZ um, are refusing to admit that they had anything to do with this project in Uganda, um, which from our perspective is very strange because in all of the documentation and, and financial information, GIZ is quite clearly listed there. Um, but we, have, we have, have had no admission of this from GIZ um, and they've also uh, not given us any further information or answers to our questions, um, which is um, disappointing to say the least. Um, great. Well, th thanks very much, um, Kariban. If anyone has more questions, um, then hopefully we'll get to them at the end as well. Um, I'd next like to introduce Almuth Ernsting. Hi. Um, hold on. Okay. Hi. Uh, yes. Let me start by doing screen share to share my presentation. Um, here we go. Okay, so I'm Almot. I work with uh, Biofuel Watch and uh, we've been working closely with Global Forest Coalition for many years. Um, you know, I work on, I, I work basically on uh, many different aspects related to bioenergy, but this, in this case, uh, I was looking specifically at the question of cook stove uh, projects. Um, as Oli said earlier, uh, so-called clean, improved cook stoves are one of the prime areas for uh, climate finance uh, for many different schemes. So, uh, although I looked, did some desktop research, which I speak about at the end, towards the end, into three different studies, 
uh, this is primarily sort of a, gen a general review of uh, what we actually know about um, uh, about um, about the the effectiveness of cook stoves. And I'm just wondering, can you see the presentation? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can. Okay. Perfect. I think I'm trying to make it bigger, but no, this is not working. No, I don't want to go on offline. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, yes, it's bigger. Sorry, that's it. Great. Uh, so, to give you a bit of an overview of the problem and the reasons why there's been so much interest in financing cook stoves. Uh, so, the situation is that right now, 40% of the global population have no access to clean uh, ways of uh, cook off uh, clean energy for cooking i.e. 40% of people worldwide have to cook in ways uh, that um, endanger, uh, endanger uh, their, uh, their house through indoor air pollution, i.e. Uh, cooking with uh, solid, uh, solid fuels. And the blue, um, where the bits in blue are the ones with clean, clean with access, and then you know the yellow ones are the most affected. Um, Household air pollution from cooking is one of the single biggest health problems in the world. It kills more people every year uh, than tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV on AIDS combined. Uh, 3.8 million deaths annually uh, from uh, indoor air pollution caused by unsafe, uh, dirty uh, ways of cooking. Um, and at the same time, you know, the, uh, the issues of, you know, what are the impacts? on forests I wanted to well first of all of course the impacts on, on women and girls um, you know it's you know big big impact on, on quality of life in relation to uh, you know having to spend hours gathering fuel wood in many cases uh, but also um, demand for fuel wood and uh, charcoal for cooking is a cause of uh, forest degradation one of the causes of serious causes of forest degradation in quite a number of different countries. So the rationale for addressing the cooks, you know, the, 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 this problem, you know, this is very, you know, there is a real need to address. It's, it's an issue that really does need to be addressed. Um, so what I did was um, I I try to see what kind of reviews and scientific reviews of studies um, of, of studies and the evidence of projects being successful, the evidence showing which kind of projects are successful, you know, to get an overview of what actually was out there. And the most recent and comprehensive review I could find, oops, no, here we go, I could find was a study that looked at 53 different studies. Um, and what the majority of those studies, and this is specifically in connection with public health, with health impact. But as you'll see, the findings and health impacts are of direct relevance also for impacts on fuel wood uh, requirements and uh, wood requirements, and thereby, you know, have a, you know, that's then having a knock-on effect on impacts on forests. So of the 53 studies, 15 were reported as having shown some benefits to women's health. And then I read those 15 studies in quite a lot of detail and analyzed them. And it actually turns out that, the, um, that some of them were entirely misrepresented, and in other cases, the, the benefits shown uh, were really, really questionable. So, quick summary of, uh, and you can read all that in the case study in quite a bit of detail. Um, so, quick summary of the evidence from, you know, this, this review of the studies. Uh, children. Every year, 630,000 630, children under the age of five uh, die from pneumonia caused by unsafe cooking. So, you know, big, big cause of, uh, of child mortality, infant mortality, or child mortality. And the systematic review was very, very clear. Not, there is no evidence whatsoever, no credible evidence has been found at all that any, even the best um, improved biomass stove uh, project have any positive effect on, on children's health, uh, that they would that they caught the risks of pneumonia in any way at all. So that's a really incredibly sad finding. Then they looked at uh, the impact on women's health, respiratory health, and uh, there the evidence was a little bit more mixed, but mostly negative, which is also really, really disappointing given the urgency of addressing, the, uh, addressing those. 
massive health problems from indoor air pollution. Out of the 53 studies, if I would, so, I mean, you can look at the methodology in the way I discussed it, but basically three of them very credibly and clearly demonstrate some positive impact on women's health, i.e. the majority don't, and of the, the ones that do, quite a few, um, there, there are problems with the studies, as, as you can see. They're either very, very small, they are not of a good setup, or the findings are contradictory. So, um, and I won't go into, uh, into all the three um, in the much detail, uh, but you know, in the first one, that those are the three studies with credible findings. Uh, the first one, the, the fact was that of the women who mainly chose to use the, uh, the, the new cook stoves, did over after 10 months um, report less coughing and wheezing and eye problems, but um, the majority of women were still cooking uh, with open fires. So there were clearly issues over the convenience and acceptability of the stove, which meant on a population basis, there was absolutely no benefit at all. It was only a benefit to this really small number, um, small percentage of women who struck with it. Um, and then there was one trial in Senegal where it showed, um, yeah, there were benefits, but mainly because people, women were able to move the stoves from in, indoors to outdoors, so they had better ventilation outdoors, obviously. And then uh, there was one in central Kenya which showed that basically anything other than cooking indoors with a three stone coal fire, uh, sorry, a three stone wood fire was better. And the best way, but that switching from wood to charcoal indoors was still better than uh, switching from indoors cooking to um, modern improved wood stoves outdoors. So very marginal benefit and um, in terms of charcoal switching from wood to charcoal is also definitely not good for, um, for the uh, into for forest because it's very very inefficient. So that was it. That these were the only clear, uh, only really good reasonable findings positive findings on women's respiratory health. Then I thought it was interesting to look at the two, what are probably the two best, longest, and really most thorough trials uh, done. Um, one, an older trial in Guatemala that was widely reported as uh, supporting the use of um, the potential benefits from bio, uh, improved biomass stoves. You can see one of them there. Um, but Actually, the benefits found were relatively small. So you had after 12 and 18 months, women reported better, less symptoms, less coughing and less wheezing and less eye problems. Um, there were reductions in blood pressure. Uh, there was no improvement in the lung functions at all. And child health was not improved in any way. So yes, on self-reported measures in blood pressure, there was some improvement, uh, definitely. But um, it went along with the uh, stoves being relatively expensive, much more expensive than what uh, uh, what would be funded in a lot of the climate finance projects that go for mass uptake. You know, really speaking of a few hundred really good expensive stoves. And women got weekly visits to advise them and support them in maintaining the stoves, using them properly. That would not be done in any, in any climate finance project ever. So that was a RESPIRE trial. And then there was one in a larger trial, the largest one I think to date, a four-year trial in um, Indian state of Leinster called Orissa, now Orissa, um, which mirrored where they deliberately replicated what you see in most climate finance projects, which is Women are given stoves, they are told how to advise them how to use them. These are stoves that have been tested. I mean, they, they are efficient. They, if used properly, they burn much more cleanly than the traditional ones. Um, they are made, they are low cost. They are made from locally available materials. But women are then basically left to it once they have them installed and have been shown how to use them. So what you had, uh, what they found was um, that initially only 25%, sorry, 
women cooked only on average 25% of their meals through the new stoves. Most women still used um, open fires in the, for most of their meals. And um, women did inhale less smoke uh, in the first year, but over time, as they fell into disrepair, they were not fixed, they were gradually abandoned uh, over the years. And there was absolutely no health benefit on any measurement whatsoever, not self-reported. Um, yeah, really nothing. So that is the biggest trial. So what are the reasons for the poor results? Well, one is often that the stoves that perform that the wrong stoves are handed out, that they they rely on laboratory uh, on on laboratory tests that are pretty useless. Uh, or that they work well if um, women chop the piece wood into minute pieces, but women don't have the time to do that. So then they are told, or oh, the women are using it wrongly and not appropriately, and they end up being potentially more polluting. But this is not what happened in, uh, for example, the uh, the India trial, or really in the trials that we looked at. That's what's happening in a lot of, a lot of other projects. The big problem is that the need for maintenance and repairs is rarely met um, and uh, that, that you simply have uh, them falling into disuse, uh, not being taken up. But one big problem is that no stove project has been shown to actually reduce pollution levels to within the World Health Organization guidelines. Quick issue over, for, uh, over the climate accounting, big scandal, I'll try and go through it quickly now. Uh, so um, we've got which I think is really scandalous. The climate um, accounting works on the basis that if, if a woman or girl burns firewood uh, from that they pick up themselves uh, for cooking, then that's non-renewable and greenhouse gas emitting. If you've got a big power station in Europe and North America or, uh, that burns millions of tons of wood, that's carbon neutral and renewable. And that's simply a scandal that, that, that that's how it's accounted for. Now, I'm not going to look at, you could, I mean, you can get the presentations afterwards at the, you know, three projects uh, we, uh, we looked at that were really, uh, you know, two of them funded by the Jeff, one funded uh, by, co-funded by BMZ, uh, the uh, German Ministry for International Cooperation. Um, they were really, really uh, awful, sound really, really up as shoddy, shoddy as can be. In read, read the top uh, uh, in, in the report, and you can get the presentation. So, overall, the conclusion uh, is why should they not get climate finance? One is that um, the scandal I showed you earlier, this, for this reason, it is simply wrong to say that biomass is emitting if it's burned by families uh, in uh, low income families in the global south, but it's non emissive if it's burned in on industrial scale elsewhere. Um, I mean, that's really unacceptable. Uh, secondly, uh, all for climate finance stove projects rely on mass dissemination with rather than, you know, really community support. And those projects have been shown across board to not be successful. They do not work for public health and they do not work for reducing uh, the use of water and thereby uh, reducing pressures on forests. And I also personally think that reliance on solid fuels for cooking is first and foremost should be addressed as a public health crisis, uh, not as a way to, um, to make greenhouse gas savings. I mean, it's first and foremost really a, a public health scandal, primarily for women and girls, women and children. Um, there are real solutions that should be financed uh, by climate finance, I believe. They're more expensive, but they work. Um, you know, this is biogas, um, you know, localized community-based biomass cookers, uh, cooking uh, burns really cleanly, solar cooking, and electrification. If you saw earlier the areas where, um, you know, where, where there's almost complete uh, say access to safe cooking is Brazil, where that was done uh, under a previous and better present than Bolonsaro by uh, many times, uh, you know, through the, you know, big, big rural electrification program. Of course, for the climate, it then matters, of course, we, how the electricity is generated. Uh, but at least, you know, you have, a, uh, in terms of the public health Im impact, all three options are really, really good. 
And just as a last slide, I would say that I wouldn't want to use uh, my presentation as an argument against community-led stove improvements in the absence of better options. So many cases, communities have no access to these technologies, right? And the only thing that can really practically be done is uh, risk harm minimization, risk reduction. Uh, and uh, we have seen, for example, from the project in Guatemala, that with a lot of you know, appropriate stores, lots of involvement of families in choosing them and women in choosing the right stoves and lots of support with maintenance and repairs of the stove. Um, you can get some benefit. Not, they don't solve the problem, but you can get some, you know, you can get some improvements in, in terms of risk, uh, risk, minimum, risk reduction. So I would definitely wouldn't want to diss all the, you know, the work being done at the community level but we need to remember for climate, you know, from a climate finance point of view, climate finance is there, should be there to help uh, poorer countries uh, get the technologies they need to actually uh, put themselves on the right path to a cleaner future. And simply paying money for something with marginal or no benefits um, when, you know, when we should be funding, you know, real, those real, you know, real solutions, uh, in my view, is just really wrong. So I shall stop there. Thank you very much uh, for that, Almuth. Um, yeah, I would just like to remind people if you've got a question for any of the presenters, um, please put it in the question and answer box so that we can deal with them um, properly and not in the chat box because that's more for, for technical issues um, and things like that. Um, I, hopefully, uh, Juana's question was answered at the end of um, Almuth's um, presentation. Um, and then, oh, there's also a comment about the fact that um, uh, solar options should be fine. Okay, that's great. Um, in that case, um, any other questions, hopefully we will get to at the end um, and we will move straight on to uh, Leanne's presentation. Hi, um, thanks so much uh, for allowing me to participate in, in the webinar. It's really exciting. Uh, so I'm Leanne Schalatek from the Heinrich Böll Foundation, Washington DC office. Uh, and my presentation and focus is going to be on, um, uh, let me just see where it is, I'm sorry, share. I'm sorry, here we go. Um, it's going to be on uh, the involvement of the Green Climate Fund um, in, in uh, tree plantations, biomass, electricity, and bioenergy. Uh, so, um, just to give you a, a really quick overview, and I know that we probably will be running out of time, why is it important to look at what the Green Climate Fund um, is doing in the area of tree plantations, bioenergy, and biomass? Um, it is the main multilateral financing channel on the, um, for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Um, as the largest um, multilateral climate fund, um, it is uh, giving a, a, a very important si signaling function to the wider markets, including through its network of now 97 implementation partners. And those include most of all UN agencies, most um, MDBs, multilateral development banks, uh, a number of large private sector commercial banks, uh, but also uh, the um, uh, finance institutions that are in the, in the International Development Finance um, Club. Uh, so a whole range of very important actors. You see here the portfolio dashboard uh, for, for the GCF, what it has been involved in. Its mandate is to support the paradigm shift in, res in recipient developing countries by supporting low emission and climate resilient development pathways. But this mandate is not compatible with all solutions in biomass and bioenergy. Um, and this is particularly concerning because um, uh, uh, currently the GCF has no exclusion list of technologies, has no detailed sector guidelines, so it does not outline certain no-go areas in projects or programs. And we are seeing with the GCF now starting its first replenishment period that there is an increased focus on maximizing private sector leverage through a focus on planted finance and the increased use of intermediation, including through a set of financing facilities with equity investment being pushed um, and decreased reliance on loans. 
Um, I wanted to go into a couple, uh, again, very briefly uh, on a couple of uh, project examples. Maybe uh, the most important, because most important, because it's the most disturbing, is an um, approved project that was approved um, at the last board meeting in March of this year as the first private sector forestry project um, that was um, included under a mobilizing funds of scale pilot program of the GCF. Um, this has the GCF um, providing an equity investment of 25 million, with it providing a stamp of approval and a signal to other investors to come in for a total projected um, uh, size of the fund of 200 million. It's um, uh, basically um, brought to the fund or was brought to the fund by MUFG Bank in Japan, acting as the accredited entity, but the implementing entity is the Abaro Fund. And this also points to one of the first program that you have several layers of intermediation. The money goes to MUFG Bank, who passes it on to a borrow fund, who invests it um, uh, as an equity funder in specific fund projects. And all of that um, with the resulting dilution of accountability and transparency uh, for social and environmental safeguards for ensuring um, that actually benefits accrue and the fund's duration is 15 years, while some of the projects um, that are proposed will be running much, much longer. And again, the question is what happens after the fund is dissolved after 15 years? You have proposed eight to 12 so-called sustainable plantation forestry projects in a number of countries for a total of 75,000 um, hectares industrial tree plantation, which claims um, of emissions reduction through monoculture tree plantations. And that's um, uh, relying largely on invasive species like acacia and eucalyptus uh, with a harvest period of 12 to 15 years. The goal, according to the Abaro Fund prospectus, is wood products for furniture manufacturing or construction with only residue or waste for biomass power production. However, the assumption that uh, they will be able to set up local or regional processing chains for timber products is very unrealistic. So overall, and um, civil society, and you see here a listing of various uh, civil society calls and letters to the Green Climate Fund board linked um, on, on the presentation, um, have described it as a blueprint for failure. First of all, the claim that it's a private sector fund is ridiculous uh, since most of the money that has been put in so far is actually coming from uh, public investors, the GCF obviously, but also EIB and FinFund. Um, as mentioned, there is a lack of accountability through the double intermediation structures, no accountability uh, after 15 years at all. There is an irresponsible access strategy with just the assumption um, uh, that whoever um, the the, the uh, projects are then finally sold off to will will uh, uh, continue with sustainable uh, production. Uh, the use of exotic spaces um, had very limited assessment of impacts on water supplies or fire risks. Uh, there is a claim to um, FSC certification, but um, this is inadequate as has been shown to avoid negative social, gender, environmental, or economic impacts, including, and this is um, very clear from the experience uh, of what colleagues have said, but also what civil society, uh, research, indigenous peoples, um, communities, uh, and organizations has showcased, including land conflict got their food sovereignty, and which will be the case in the Aboro uh, Fund project as well. We have, um, as a little success story, an avoided biomass uh, project in the Green Climate Fund that was a proposed biomass program in the South Pacific that was proposed by the Korean Development Bank for Fiji and, and Papua New Guinea. It had proposed, um, and it would have been the first large-scale private sector mass program, again, now the Abaro Fund is the first one in the GCF with five biomass power plants and a wood pellet plant. And those wood pellets, which would have taken up basically a third of the energy produced uh, through the biomass power plants, would have then produced wood pellets for exports to South Korea. 
So needless to say, this is a, would have been a horrible, horrible project. Um, uh, I was vehemently opposed by civil society. We had a massive advocacy push, including a collaboration with top scientists, multiple letters to the board, a media campaign. And the focus of the advocacy was focusing primarily on showcasing the technical fallacy of uh, claiming that you actually have carbon emissions reductions uh, through the components of that biomass program. And you see at the button there, um, there is a little calculation uh, overview table, uh, which very thorough um, um, calculation that civil society colleagues, and I think Almut and others were actually involved in it and showcasing actually what a fallacy the assumption it is that those components would uh, uh, bring an emissions reduction. There was then an attempt made to quote unquote save the proposal by including component two, which was the wood, pe wood pellet plant, but it was very clear, including through the work that civil society has done, um, that it would not find the approval of the board and was withdrawn by KDB, by the Korean Development Bank. And what is even more important, it seems to have disappeared from the Korean development uh, pipeline. And that shows obviously that in that case, uh, showcasing the technical proof that the two main components would lead to no, no net emissions reduction but exacerbate global warming uh, has helped, particularly also because it showcased the weakness of the GCF's technical advisory body, which had to come out and actually reissue um, its technical assessment to correct uh, for, for um, the uh, calculations that civil society has made. Another project that was unfortunately approved um, is one um, called Poverty Reforestation, Energy and Climate Change Proesa uh, in Paraguay. Um, it was proposed and is being now implemented by the FAO uh, with the support of the government of, of Paraguay. It had several components, including a social pro uh, uh, protection program and a cleaner um, cook stoves and we just heard about the fallacy of some of the cleaner cook stove approaches. Although, um, and again, Almond mentioned that this is actually some of the better alternative. It did not include any proposal for rural electrification or solar cookers as an alternative for pure wood. And then it had the very problematic component too, which was called sustainable landscapes and responsible markets. And again, this is under implementation, which provides concessional credits to create 24,000 hectares of tree plantations with a focus on fast growing species. Um, they have been very coy of um, not saying especially what species they are considering, but on the other hand, they have also not excluded potentially using eucalyptus or other invasive uh, species. They no clear indication on how the produced biomass will be used. Um, it claims to promote charcoal um, involved. Uh, sorry, I'm seeing that my, my connection is unstable. I hope you can hear me. Um, that the uh, uh, FAO proposal uh, promote charcoal production, which could be directed towards producing bioenergy for the soy sector, such as to uh, use the energy to dry soy grains. Um, this project comes in Paraguay after a 13-year-old uh, deforestation moratorium was revoked and it allows for replacement of natural forests by monoculture tree foundations. And so the fear by Paraguayan civil society and indigenous peoples groups, again, you can see the work that the Global Forest Coalition and others have done on opposing that, is that Proesa could undermine the ongoing resistance of small farmers against the expansion and deforestation um, caused by soy and basically incentivize farmers to become integrated into the soy production chain. And uh, as uh, the problem that we have with many of those projects um, in climate finance, and that's not just for biomass and, and bioenergy, but it's obviously very prevalent there, particularly it is, involves communally held land or indigenous people's land, there is very often insufficient stakeholder consultation and very little evidence that free prior and informed consent um, is being fulfilled. I wanted to show you um, this uh, table overview. I've actually done 
done um, through the project portfolio of now 129 projects and have looked uh, for where there is uh, the potential for some uh, biomass uh, projects and programs. Um, one of the biggest problems that, that, that I see or that we see within the GCF, that it's very clear when a project or a program is labeled biomass, bioenergy, uh, clean cooking fuels. However, the Green Climate Funds um, gives a huge amount of money um, to so-called financing facilities, funds of funds of funding programs, like basically the equity fund that is the Abora fund, where at the time of approval, it's not quite clear what um, individual sub-projects to be approved at a later stage will look like. So what it basically does, it gives a lot of money and carte blanche to a lot of operators. And if you can see here, the ones in uh, yellow are actually so-called private sector programs in the GCF. But all of those private sector programs are implemented by multilateral and bilateral um, uh, development finance institutions. So you have actually no private sector actor in there. What is very insidious is that at the time of the approval, it just lists um, indicative technology. So it might say, you know, biomass or bioenergy could be something that we are investing in, or you're up to 10% of our investments might go into biomass or bio waste to energy. The problem is that there is then usually very little transparency and follow up, including from civil society organizations that monitor and follow the GCF um, to then look what um, the EBRD in the case of the EBRD CEF or the EIB in the case of the JRF Next project that was supposed is doing in the individual sub-projects. And so I think the potential for the GCF funding biomass and potentially back biomass is, is larger than you could see. Um, I also wanted to quickly showcase um, a couple of other GCF projects that include bio and bioenergy option, including two specific projects that are focusing on uh, clean cooking solutions. Uh, with a variety of factors. Again, the yellow ones are the ones that are so-called private sector projects. So how can we prevent um, that future GCF biomass um, funding? What are some of the intervention points? So there, is, um, there are a couple of things that are going on that I think are instructive for particular civil society advocacy in the GCF and the pushback. One is the ongoing development of GCF sector guidance. And as I mentioned so far, there are no specific sector guidance, but it's hugely important that you get um, some clearer indication of what is possible, but also what is not allowable. Uh, relevance for restricting GCF investment in biomass, bioenergy, uh, is in several individual distinct sector uh, consultation efforts. And here, um, I personally feel that it's very tricky and very dangerous because all of those sector um, uh, guidelines are, in, uh, are basically uh, consulted and so cross-cutting issues like, for example, the issue of biomass, bioenergy, which touches uh, the sector uh, on um, sector guidance on agriculture and food security, the sector guidance Sorry, I'm seeing, uh, I have the unstable connecting. The sector guidance on energy generation and access on forestry and land use on water and ecosystem and ecosystem services is not necessarily um, included. The timetable for this is unclear because obviously of the COVID restriction. However, so far we only had a first round of technical consultations. And this again is very uh, critical and concerning because the voices and experiences of local communities, indigenous peoples, and civil society so far have not been reflected in those consultations. Another area is the finalization of the GCF strategic plan, uh, as the GCF is basically heading into its uh, first replenishment period, giving basically the, the guidelines where the fund is, uh, is, is, is going to go. And there again, it would be very important to ensure there is no clear push for bioenergy. We had first drafts of, of the 
year strategic plan where there were, was explicit reference to actually increasing investment in, in biomass. This uh, in the latest draft can no longer be found. However, we have to be very vigilant that it doesn't creep in. Um, also, um, we should uh, work on reactivating and strengthening, including uh, by getting more uh, expertise, CSO expertise from outside into it, the existing GCF CSO working group on biomass and bioenergy that was founded when we actually pushed back against the KDB proposal that we were able um, to, to, um, to kill um, by repudiating the mitigation reasoning. Um, and I think it would be very helpful for such a group to work more proactively with the technical advisory panel so that they stop providing those cloying uh, technical references or endorsements for a project. Every project in the GCF has to get basically the, the endorsement of the ITEP in order to go forward to the board. And so working with the ITEP, I think, could be a very good strategy. And lastly, of course, we need to amplify national civil society, local communities, and their key voices in the project recipient countries throughout the project cycle uh, by making them aware and strengthening their early engagement um, in this uh, project development where we do have concept notes by including their experience in project analysis that then goes on the global level to the board and also by uh, implementing monitoring of approved projects such like unfortunately the Abaro Fund one or the Proesa one through collaboration with relevant network and that includes uh, the Global Forest Coalition, um, that includes CLARA, um, that includes also joint uh, uh, civil society capacity building and monitoring efforts such as the GCF uh, watch website um, and, and uh, collection of information that is available. So with that, I thank you for your attention and look forward to questions. Thank you very much, Leanne. Um, great, so we've got uh, about 25 minutes left for Q&A and to answer any questions that haven't been already. Um, I've seen that the panelists have been typing answers, which is great. Um, so yeah, if you've got any, any further questions, please just type them into the, the question and answer um, feature. Uh, I can see there there's one from uh, Annabelle uh, for David Kariba. Um, would you like to answer that one, David? I don't know if you can see it. Um, but it's basically asking how the project in Uganda could have been better designed and if um, uh, avoiding um, invasive species might have helped. Uh, and then if there's other species that could have been planted that would have had a better impact. Would you like to answer that one, David? Uh, thank you, Oli. And, uh, you know, as campaigners, as environmentalists, first of all, if one is promoting alien species at the expense of indigenous species. That one itself is a killer move and in one way or the other that is promoting climate change. But what I would say is that if there is no way I can say that the eucalyptus project would have been designed better. But maybe what I can say is that that money should not have been invested in eucalyptus in plantation and improving charcoal uh, production. Probably that money would have been invested in renewable energy, for example, solar or something else. Secondly, if we are looking at for example, uh, carbon sequestration or carbon trading would have looked at in the endemic species that are of broad leaves that, that can sequester that are endemic in the area that would actually even exhibit the element of permanence as opposed to you plant, then you cut. I think the best way should have been planting trees that sequester carbon and investing in uh, probably sustainable renewable energy as opposed to uh, planting eucalyptus because eucalyptus to very many places has become a menace if, if it is planted near next to wetland the wetland dries up it is planted on you know, a hilltop the water table tends to lower so i think uh, the, 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 the 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 design of the project to, to bring in uh, eucalyptus really was a little bit of a foreign idea it was not a community idea. It was not something that would help communities, but instead maybe it was looking at timber or, or electric poles or something like that, since Uganda was running electric efforts. Then, uh, uh, 
on, on, on also on the evaluation of whether to pro project a kid. If they are supposed to produce and provide thousands of kasimene, uh, for example, uh, kilns, and they were never given. That one itself shows that the project failed because there is no way if, for example, uh, eucalyptus plantations grew, if they would not use the modern methods of now converting them, we would not expect any good results. And uh, uh, secondly, there was a report that was done by another independent researcher, which also indicated that uh, there are no good results really realized by the project. And uh, uh, whether or not the project did not achieve. If, if one kiln or three or five kilns that were given are not functioning, then there is no one can say that the project uh, achieved its intended objective. I would certainly say that uh, it did not. And even if some other person went on ground, you will see that it is like any other thing. There isn't anything that this project added. Yeah, I stopped there. Great, thanks very much, um, Kariba. Um, right, let's just have a look at other questions. Um, so this was one for Leanne, and, and if you could explain a bit more about private, in se uh, private sector involvement with GCF funding, um, and if they're really in favor of the, the solutions to climate change that they are promoting. I, I, I think, Sorry. I think. Go ahead. Was that my question or your question? Oh, th this one was addressed to Leanne, actually. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the question. Um, so, so um, maybe on the involvement of the, the uh, private sector in the GCF, um, the uh, private sector can be involved uh, in several ways in the GCF. One is um, uh, becoming directly accredited and receiving money directly from the GCF. For example, we have a number of private sector commercial banks like, for example, Deutsche Bank, like MUFG, like HSBC, like Credit Agricole, um, that, that are accredited and can propose projects and will then get uh, money directly. This is one way. Another way is, um, as I've, I've shown through some of the financing facilities, that you have development finance um, uh, institutions like MDBs or, or, or bilateral uh, um, um, like uh, the Agence France de Développement, that proclaim that they will be working with the private sector, will get money from the GCF as a private sector project, and then work specifically in, in um, for example, passing on money to local financial institution, investing in private sector projects, and so on and so forth. The, uh, GCF um, has as its mandate um, uh, the, the uh, call to actually maximize um, private sector finance and private sector involvement so that private sector leverage is always something that they are striving and, and pushing for. And, and so um, uh, this, this is one of the reasons why, for example, you see a number of pilot programs, including the Mobilizing Financing at Scale program, which is a 500 million pilot program, under which it was possible um, to bring in the project proposal for the Abaro Fund. And I have to say, particularly forestry, private sector forestry and private sector related forestry market is something um, that the GCF has put um, its eyes on and really sees it as an opportunity um, to make a big impact. So. Um, uh, as somebody that, that is worried about sustainable uh, forestry, um, of keeping the private sector out of carbon markets and so on and so forth, I would really watch what the Green Climate Fund is doing because they are really pushing in that direction. Um, thanks, Leanne. Um, yeah, so uh, one from Bola that I thought maybe um, the panelists can answer is, um, what CSO strategies can there be in response to mass scale monoculture tree plantations? Um, so, uh, Bola is saying that in Nepal, the government owned agency is converting natural forest into plantation forest and promoting eucalyptus um, in uh, the southern part of Nepal. Um, so, I know that Federica already answered this in the chat, but I was wondering if uh, anyone else, uh, anyone else, uh, Daisy maybe, or, or Kariba or Leanne, 
and um, would like to answer more about you know CSO strategies to actually stop large scale um, tree plantations. Can I come in? Yeah, please do. Uh, I think I think this is something that over time we have tried to fight, but uh, I think it is increasingly becoming a challenge. One, if you see uh, the EIS, the way they are done, and the promises that are given to communities, this is where the challenge comes in. Some of the communities need economic empowerment as opposed to talking up about the trees. If, if for example, a community person doesn't have to feed for the ch child food or any other small thing, medical care, then it becomes a very big challenge at some point. But what we are trying to tell them with what is happening around is that one, it is their climate that is getting destroyed and that the planting should not be allowed on their plots of land. Secondly, when one looks at how they used to get firewood and how they are struggling to get, communities are struggling to get firewood now, we are saying they can do boundary planting as opposed to monoculture. The boundary planting can help them to harvest to pick the dead wood in the event that they need some, you know, uh, 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 they need firewood. But the biggest problem that happens at, at times is land grabbing. Even when the communities are not very willing, the government comes in and says, this is a government project and it is, you know, benefiting and it's going to create, create employment and bring, you know, the, 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 the GDP to this level and that comes in. But we're working with communities to have uh, communal land associations, communal land associations for those areas where they are living, where they don't have like titles, so that now they communicate through one voice. And we are saying let communities use the land, use the land as opposed to leaving it just there. Because at times land is grabbed based on being seen as if it is idle. Let the land be put to use. And the customary governance systems, what is also uh, becoming a problem is uh, somehow not that the youth cannot, but when it comes to the governance using the local government, at times it becomes a challenge. But with, with the leadership through like clans, like, you know, uh, certain, that, that, in that way, there is, there is a way uh, forests can be a little bit maintained. But we are emphasizing plantations are not forests and conservation should be for communities by communities. And this business of saying plantations are going to benefit. The good thing is that we have had, we have had oil palm displacing people from their territory. And now the territory that was occupied by people it is now occupied by eucalyptus and occupied by palm oil. So we try as much as we can to have that the skill share, bringing communities to visit another community so that they learn eventually, I think, uh, we shall curtail on the expansion of forest. That is the strategy that we are working on, but still, the element of land grabbing at times fails the effort of small site organization. Um, thanks very much, Kariba. Um, okay, so another question here from Lawrence Connell uh, is: Are there examples uh, involving forest, uh, sorry, involving forest conservation that do work? Um, um, I'll invite all the panelists to answer that question, but I wondered if Federica just wanted to talk about the uh, Vreda Funda. Um, project in Minas Gerais and also the Khet um, and uh, you know how they helped to, to improve the situation there. Uh, Federica, are you still with us? Yeah. Cool, so it was just a question about uh, examples of forest conservation that do work. Um, so good examples. So I was just wondering yeah. if you could talk about the, you know, the good examples of the Getomadas in, um, yeah. in and the Vera de Funda. Yeah. Um, we can say about the Vereta Funda that uh, in uh, 2011, uh, the Vereta Funda that is a community in uh, Rio Pardo de Minas undertook the agricultural restoration project from monoculture eucalypto to agro-silva uh, pastoral system. 
the project has become an example of the successful restoration of spring, of uh, um, repairing forests, showing that it is possible to restore the Cerrado ecosystem where it is being destroyed by eucalyptus plantation, for example. I'm sorry, I didn't turn on the, the camera. Um, the project aims to um, uh, return uh, a more or less uh, uh, 170 um, uh, hectares of land that were leased to plantation company during uh, uh, the decades uh, of uh, 1780. Um, they um, another example that uh, Oliver were uh, doing is the retomada. I brought it on the on the um, on the chat too uh, because I think that uh, is a case is a practice that can be uh, repeated uh, all over the world, and the retomada is. It means uh, in uh, Portuguese, right, retake. So um, I was saying that in Brazil, um, for example, is uh, the, the, the land are acquired, so, uh, and uh, the people just have to move. No, outside the land. So what a lot of uh, community from Minas Gerais and for example, I visit, some, I visit some retomada in Espiritu Santo, where I live, uh, they did and uh, they come back to the territory, come back to the um, eucalypto monoculture and they occupied it. They, what happened in the 90 was they, they cut uh, all the tree, they burn it and unfortunately they have to do it uh, like uh, every year or every two years because eucalyptus tree are very resistant and uh, they are practicing agroecology. So it's very tough, it's very hard because uh, uh, the, um, the soil uh, is um, really poor, became very poor. So, uh, and uh, apart from this, the Cerrado area uh, is, um, is drying up due to um, due to the presence of eucalypto for many years so it's not simple but for local community traditional community veredeiras community is like important just the practice to retake um, the symbolical practice to retake a territory and create uh, a, a different uh, um, way of uh, manage the territory like the agroecology. Uh, so I think that these two practice, these two example uh, positive, in my opinion, example embracing can be an example for uh, various territory. Thank you. Thanks very much for that answer, Federica. Um, and another uh, one that I just wanted to read out from Kamal, um, is what are the best alternatives to monocultures for protecting and restoring forests and how can we ensure that the rights of indigenous peoples and communities are respected? So I don't know if, if one of our panelists wants to um, volunteer for that, but I wondered maybe also if Leanne could speak about, so I guess we, you know, we talk a lot about the bad projects that are funded by GCF and other people. What kind of things make good projects? And as Kamal's saying, how can we ensure that the rights of indigenous peoples and communities are respected through these projects yeah so um, I, I i think the the evidence is still out that some of the approved projects in the gcf are really good projects um because um you know they are not all implemented yet what you can judge them on um normally is basically what you see in terms of um documentation paperwork coming into and the, particularly the documentation of the engagement with stakeholders in the preparation and the development of proposals. Um, but I think a couple of things can help, for example, the GCF and other climate funders to have at least better projects, 
having a very strong human rights based approach, um, including very strong um, protective measures where it's very clear you are not just safeguarding, but you are actually obligating uh, your implementing entities to do good, whether that is actively promoting gender equality um, ensuring, you know, free, prior and informed consent of indigenous um, and local communities for, for projects that might be in their, in their territory and affect their livelihoods. Um, but also, obviously, looking at ways where you can uh, promote projects that are, quote unquote, much closer to the ground, are not uh, intermediated 15, 16 levels of, of, of distance uh, from the financing to um, uh, potentially or supposedly uh, providing profit, uh, um, benefits on the ground. So for example, in the Green Climate Fund, we have pushed very much uh, for some uh, so-called devolved climate financing um, decisions, um, where you would, for example, through a creation of um, small grants programs, make sure that funding in much smaller amounts is more directly available to local groups on the grounds um, to, uh, to support some of, of, of their projects. We have a couple of um, pilot programs and approaches in the GCF. Unfortunately, and there I think is the question of not what is feasible, but is what, what the political will is, there is a, a lot of pushback from the contributor countries, the developed countries uh, providing funding in the Green Climate Fund who seem to be um, in that case, particularly a lot more interested in parceling out um, large sums of money into financing facilities, like the ones that I showcased, rather um, than, than giving money out in, in smaller junks uh, so that they could be used uh, by local communities directly. Um, we've seen the willingness to take risk um, very much extended um, through um, uh, financial uh, financialization approaches, um, large scale financial institutions, but not with smaller scale actors. And so I think some of the push that we need to do is actually really uh, presenting and showcasing as good as turn uh, alternative as an effective alternative where effectiveness is not just defined as cost effectiveness, those type of approaches that are much closer to the ground. And there, I think the rule of subsidiarity that you should implement at the lowest level possible is really something um, that should be a guiding principle. Um, thanks very much, Leanne. Um, right, I think that's probably all the questions um, dealt with. So I actually just wanted to give um, Daisy uh, Bishpur, an opportunity to have the final word on any of these questions, but also um, maybe specifically uh, on that issue of, uh, you know, how, how it is actually possible to restore forests and ecosystems. So maybe if you could just tell us about some of the work that's involved in uh, the Seng Saradu Se Agua Seng Vida campaign. Um, you know, we've heard about the importance of, um, of targeting you know, agricultural expansion, whether it's for eucalyptus or for um, cattle ranching. Um, but what about the alternatives to that and how communities can be supported to, to protect and restore forests? Hello. So first I would like to suggest you all to follow the campaign on the social media network. They are united in this coalition. Now they are very focused on emergency um, communication uh, programs and analysis because here in Brazil we are asking too much how we can influence the politics uh, background if we are at home, how we can make advocacy at home. So now everyone is asking this for it from themselves. So it's very important by in our house we still follow the agenda, the campaign agenda. And also if you, you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, and I think it's very important to support even in our house this um, approach because as uh, Frederica has said, this 
group of in traditional indigenous people, women, peasants, they not only are fighting for a biome, they are fighting for a lifestyle. So please let me know if you have any questions or any doubts in the campaign website. You can know more about what they are doing and what they are focused principally in these times of COVID pandemic. Um, thanks very much, uh, Daisy. Um, yep, so we've reached the end of the webinar now. I'd like to thank all of our panelists very much for their time and for their presentations and also for answering uh, all of the questions. And I'd also really like to thank all of you participants for joining us as well. Um, so you can find all of the work that's been discussed today uh, on our website. And if you have any further questions, then please don't hesitate to drop us an email. Um, also, to be notified of future GFC events and publications, uh, you can subscribe to um, our email list um, via the link that I will put into uh, the chat box right now. Um, there we go. Um, yep, so uh, that's it. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, yeah, we, we hope to, to be with you again in, in the near future. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>